My name is Sara Pantuliano. I'm a managing director here at the Overseas Development Institute and I lead the humanitarian resilience teams here at ODI. But I'm also somebody who has worked a lot in the Horn of Africa, including in Eritrea, although it's been a few years since I've visited Eritrea. And I've always had an incredible passion for that part of the world. And so when I heard them, you know, Martin was uh, um, about to publish his book on Eritrea, and I thought, oh, you know, this is the occasion to have a debate on Eritrea um, at ODI. And that's why we've convened this event. But obviously, Eritrea has been in the news quite a lot, you know, obviously related to, um, to the number of, you know, uh, migrants and asylum seekers that have been coming <coughs> from Eritrea to, to Europe. I mean, if you look at the numbers just in 2015, they made the second largest group of migrants that crossed the Mediterranean after the Syrians, although some would contend that probably they were the biggest, you know, group altogether. Um, you know, it was a total of almost 40,000 Eritreans, you know, estimated to have crossed the Mediterranean last year. And yet there is another story, you know, that if you look at just a few years ago, in 2011, it was only 600, 650. 60 people that crossed, you know, to come um, to Europe. And some, you know, people would argue that actually the fact that so many Eritreans have been granted asylum almost became a pull factor that, you know, led many of them to, to make the journey. And that's, you know, the, where the polarization exists, along with a lot of, you know, the polarized view that exists, you know, between Eritreans in the country, which is why we wanted to have a debate about what the real situation is in the country. We have seen different judgments on Eritrea, you know, the, obviously the the Danish report last year saying that, you know, actually the situation is terrible, you know, the situation is not as terrible as it should be and people should not be granting asylum. Then, you know, a, a court in the UK actually judging that no, you know, people returning to Eritrea are still at, you know, danger and, and therefore, you know, sort of influencing the Home Office to re reverse its guidelines. Well, what is the real situation on the ground? You know, can we can we talk about it? You know, in a way that hopefully you know brings um, brings out some of the nuances in the debate. Um, so. Before I introduce the panel, I just want to welcome the online audience. We have quite a lot of people are following the debate online. I will give everyone an opportunity to ask questions. We'll let the panelists speak first, of course, and then we'll uh, we'll open it up for questions and answers. So hold your questions until I open up, open it up to the floor. And for people online, do put your questions through the live chat or through Twitter, and I'll read them through um, the iPad. For those who tweet, the hashtag for the event is Eritrea Migration. Um, so those in the room, put your phones on silent, but feel free to tweet, to put your phone on silent. And then let me, you know, um, introduce the speaker. Well, I did mention, you know, Martin Plout. Martin um, has been following Eritrea for 30 years or so. You followed and covered Eritrea during the struggle, of course. He is the author of Understanding Eritrea. I think you're allowed to show the book, Martin, if you want. Um, and he's currently a fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies in London. Um, he was the African editor at the BBC World Service for a very long time until he retired in November 2012. But we've discovered that you know, retirement is a good thing because he, he, he allows people to write books. You've written two books this year. So I'm very jealous, actually. But yeah, Martin very frequently advises the Foreign Office and the State Department on, uh, on the region. Um, to my right, we have Ms. Gina Abraha, who is actually a third-year PhD student at SOAS, doing a PhD on the role of social media and migration decisions of Eritrean migrants. Uh, but, you know, uh, Ms. Gina is actually focused on Eritrean education and worked in Eritrea, in the education sector, for a very long time in different roles, you know, as a teacher, as a curriculum developer, as a teacher trainer, so, you know, 20 years spent in the sector. And he developed, you know, helped develop the national ICT in education policy and is the co-author of inclusive education policy in Eritrea. He's currently a research uh, associate at PENA, which is the Pastures Development Network for the Horn of Africa, right? And he focuses on education for nomadic pastoralists in the Horn of Africa. And to my far right is Dr. Georgia Cole, just been awarded her PhD <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, so just been <laughs> awarded her D field by the University of Oxford. She's the Joyce Pierce Junior Research Fellow um, at the University of Oxford, and her D field um, in, focused on uh, the labeling, the politics of labeling, you know, using the refugee label, uh, exploring in particular the, the secession clauses for Rwanda and Eritrean refugees. So Georgia, and probably she'll talk about it, you know, has really been focusing on the value that the refugees 
refugee label um, does have for uh, Eritreans in particular. But she teaches um, at Oxford on durable solutions at the Refugee Study Center and has an ongoing affiliation as a research and teaching fellow at the College of Arts and Social Sciences in Eritrea. So you probably have noticed that the, some of the names on the panel have changed. Unfortunately, Mary Harper has been held back at the BBC because she's covering a breaking story that will actually break now um, on uh, on South Africa and Zuma and corruption charges against Zuma and you know, she's reporting live on this. So you know, if she can't be with us tonight, um, we have managed to <laughs> identify a fourth panelist at the very last minute. So she's running late, but she will join us um, in uh, in a few minutes. Is Ruby Sando? I'll introduce Ruby when she joins the panel. But let's start with the panelists we have here. Um, Martin, in, in your book you talk a lot, you discuss, describe a uh, length, you know, the history of Eritrea, um, you know, its internal political and economic structures, the regional relations. Why is history so important to understand Eritrea? I think it's, 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 an, it's an interesting question, uh, and I think it's one that one has to approach if one really wants to get any kind of understanding of what is what is going on. Because without it, you really don't see why it is that the situation is the way it is and why it is has proved so intractable. Uh, and I think that there are really a, a number of elements that one can bring in here. The first is, of course, the, the long and heroic struggle that there was by the Eritrean people for their own independence, which took place over 30 years. Um, uh, and was led by uh, Isaias Afuerki, um, who is still the president of, of the country and led them through large portions of that period. Uh, and it was an extraordinary achievement. I mean, to be able to take on one of the largest and most powerful countries in Africa, which was first supported by the United States, then uh, after the overthrow of the emperor by the Soviet Union, with the Cubans coming in, and yet despite all of this, the Eritrean people managed to overcome these through extraordinary sacrifices and to win their independence um, in an alliance with the Tigrayans, who were just across the border, and finally march into two capitals at the same time in 91, both into Asmara and into Addis Ababa. Because if it hadn't been for the Eritrean fighters, uh, the Tigrayans would not have taken the capital. And for the first couple of years, they actually supplied the security to Mela Zanawi, um, who was not at all sure about his position in, in Addis. So, uh, you know, there, there is this amazing background, and you then get the uh, achievement of independence finally recognized in 93, uh, and then the hopes of a much better relationship with the Ethiopians. So good, in fact, that the book came out, um, here it is, called uh, Ethiopian Eritrea from Conflict to Cooperation, which actually looks forward in the final chapter to a uh, sort of free trade area, perhaps even a sort of more or less like the EU for the Horn of Africa. And it was genuinely, that was genuinely was the hope at that time. Uh, I mean, I've, I've spoken to an ambassador, an Eritrean ambassador, a very senior ambassador, who said that sometimes he even represented Ethiopian causes if the, there wasn't the money to send both, the, both countries' ambassadors to, to go and cover a particular event. And that gives you a feeling for how close the relationship was. You then get this terrible breakdown with the border war, 98-2000, um, uh, catastrophic. Uh, miscalculations by the, the, the uh, Eritrean government, particularly led by President Isas, at the end of which some of his closest allies turn on him and say, you know, really, you have, you know, this is a disaster, and suggest that it is time that, first of all, that democracy is brought into play because there had been no, not a hint of democracy, and secondly, that um, it really was probably time for him to, you know, accept the will of the people. And at, uh, at this point, um, he frankly just locks up everybody in sight. Uh, everything is closed down, the newspapers are banned, his closest associates, the G15, who, who challenged him, actually reduced a bit, are in jail, and uh, the place goes into lockdown. The um, Algeria, Algiers Agreement, which set up a gold-plated uh, uh, 
system for designating the border, which had been this, uh, the apparent issue for, from which all of this arose, the, the conflict with Ethiopia, um, gave its ruling, and the Ethiopians then say, well, no, we effectively they said we're not accepting it. They said they were accepting it, but it needed further discussion. So you, you, you then have the two sides locked into a Cold War in which the Eritreans are entirely in the right, uh, in my view. I mean, they, the border was awarded to them. It is, has been demarcated. The only thing that was required was for the Ethiopians to accept this outcome. And the Ethiopians couldn't, quite frankly, because Mela Zanawi's position was so... Oh, because of his relationship with, with Eritrea would have been impossible. So he can't accept it. He doesn't accept it. There's a stalemate. The United States refuses to, frankly, push the issue because of their relationship with the, uh, in, in Somalia. And we are locked into the situation. And this produces, uh, frankly, a, situa a position which is almost like uh, 1984. I don't know if you remember the constant struggle between, I think there were three powers in, in 1984, and this just endless you know, threat from the outside. And that is the mentality that now exists. As a result, the, the, the constitution which was drawn up has never been implemented. Now the government is saying we must have a new one. There's an archipelago of uh, prison camps in which people are brutally tortured in, in, in Eritrea, and, uh, you know, and the streaming of, the, of thousands of people, nobody's quite sure, was there's no published census uh, across the border, which I will let my colleagues speak about. Um, and you know, the tragedy of Eritrea is that it is now locked into this situation. And in fact, in recent years, one Worst thing, well, two worst things have happened, and then I'll, I'll stop on this. Uh, the first is that um, Eritrea is now engaged, has disengaged from Iran, has engaged with the Saudis, I think entirely for uh, financial reasons, uh, and uh, they are in, involved in the, Houthi, the war with the Houthis in Yemen. Their bases are, bases are in Eritrea, planes are being flown, attacks are being launched from Eritrea, and it's a rear base for the uh, UAE and for the Saudis. Uh, a really bad situation. There are uh, uh, stories of hundreds of Eritrean troops on the ground. Uh, again, they'll be suffering, uh, I'm sure, very badly, and it's a really awful situation. Uh, the, the second one is that the um, Europeans, desperate to stop the flood of uh, people across the Mediterranean, uh, are, have now engaged in a long and complex relationship with the, uh, the, er the Eritrean government, the Europeans have, and uh, it's, it's a pretty awful situation where they also, in including, up to and including um, cooperation on a security basis, which I think is extremely dangerous. And, uh, I mean, internal documents have indicated that the EU, EU is aware of just how damaging it would be if all the, all of the information comes out, and they have said so in so many words. Now, the, um, uh, the, the, the situation is bad, and the worst part about it is that they keep talking and they recycle the, the language of re-engagement. The European Union keeps saying, we're going to re-engage. We are a new beginning. They have tried this five times on each time it has floundered on the uh, opposition of President Isaias, who is immovable and will not uh, make any contribution uh, either on ending the national service, which other people can speak about, or on improving human rights. So I'm afraid the situation is bad. Eritrea is locked into this conflict with, with um, Ethiopia, and I can explain in, in further detail, if people are interested, what is behind that relationship and why it is so intractable and cannot be resolved. I, th I think it generally can't be resolved. Um, and uh, you have this, this appalling situation, uh, leaving people to flee, desperate uh, human rights situation inside the country itself, and, um, you know, uh, uh, the... Uh, the uh, the problem arriving on Europe's borders. Thanks, Martin. I mean, of course, and this is what Mary was going to talk about, 
There are other views about the situation inside the country. I mean, she reported um, earlier this year from visits to Eritrea where she challenged the label of, you know, there is for the news of the, the North Korea of Africa or some of the situation on the ground. You know, she was quite surprised to see portrayed or, you know, actually sort of experiencing in a very different way. Uh, Ruby has a similar view, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask her, you know, to talk about uh, the different experience of Eritrea's other portrait, but uh, when she arrives, but Meskina, it's in, uncontrovertible that a lot of people are leaving the country. You know, there are a lot of people that are arriving. Um, so why why is it the case? I mean, is it is it such a dreadful human rights situation as some you know make out it to be, or are deeper you know issues related to poverty, the economic situation, or is it the national service that is you know the big challenging? main driver um, of this movement? Uh, thank you. Uh, to start with, I, the statistics that we see is not credible. Because what happens is the number that we got of the Eritrean migrants is taken from Sudan and Ethiopia. And these two countries, uh, they inflate the number for the reason of political reasons and logistic reasons. Therefore, uh, we have to take caution because many Ethiopians also are coming out of Ethiopia. But if you see the statistics that are going, Ethiopia refugees are nowhere within the first top 20. But if when I went to Italy and Calais last time, I've seen large communities of Ethiopian migrants there, even in some part of Calais, where the Oromo ethnic people have settled there very well and have developed, uh, built up a school in that sense. But no <coughs> number of statistics of Ethiopian migrants is there. Therefore, there is so many controversies in, in this respect. Um, when we come, why they are coming out, it's better to discuss who is coming, who is fleeing from the country, then we can deduce why. Uh, as to the narratives, there are two conflicting narratives. One is the pro-government and the government of Eritrea, which blame the hostile regional and international actors that are uh, encouraging young Eritreans to flee from the country. And this is, they say, they attribute it as what Prime Malas uh, Danawi at the beginning of the war has said, we will defeat Eritrea in long term. And the government attributes this one. This is a pre-planned uh, conspiracy against Eritrea to empower it, disempower it from its use. And there is the other uh, narrative, which is from human rights activists and the opposition in Eritrea, with the say, and the international media for that matter, attribute the blame to the authoritarian rule in Eritrea, indefinite national service, and gross human rights violations in the country. But there is also another dimension to this one which, um, according to my preliminary findings of my research, uh, we can classify the groups into three. The first one is children, especially the unaccompanied children, which is below the age of 16. The other group is people that are, can be summoned to uh, national service, which is between 17 and 40. And the third group is 40 plus. Now, if we see what the reason behind for this group is, the first group, especially the unaccompanied one, they fear of the forthcoming national service. Therefore, they want to flee the country. And this is exasperated by social media, international media through TV, which is free in Eritrea. And the Can you explain what the national service is for those in the audience that are not familiar. Ah, okay. The national service, which I was even part. I was in the national service when I was in Eritrea. 
that is meant first started in 94 where all Eritreans between the age of 18 and 40 were to go to national service for the rebuilding of the country. And it was part of six months military training and then social services. But after the border conflict, this had changed and it became indefinite. That, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Therefore, uh, the other part that influences these young uh, migrants is the Eritrean diaspora returnees. When we in the diaspora return to Eritrea, they spend they spend many uh, we can say irresponsibly, and this attracts or the young children, what they say, if I go there, I can help my family. The other group is the second group, which is the large number that goes is the number between the age between 16 and 14. These are the people that are inactive, whether they are in active military service or uh, been demobilized in certain aspects. These are the people that have seen military punishment, which sometimes that when they give, uh, they do um, the asylum claim, they refer it as a torture. But actually, it could be also a simple military uh, punishment in their regiments. But being said this one, there is also actually human rights abuse in, within that one in the military camps. and. When I was in Eritrea, I didn't know that there was a prison called Mi'atir, where uh, religious uh, Pentecostal believers were and the other defectors are harshly punished. I came across that one during my research now. Therefore, there is this dual uh, dilemma between the normal one, when we accept, they don't have any problem, as some reporters say. But um, on the other side, there is also grave human rights abuses in the country. Therefore, these people live because of perceived or real persecution and human rights abuses. The third group is, which is the elderly, who can say, is. 40 plus, usually 50 plus, this usually come for family reunion and the very few because of uh, persecution and other factors. But when we come, the real cause to me is more complex than this one. The main cause is, to me, is the unresolved border conflict which the government itself is taking it as pretext, pretext for every human rights abuse. And they not being able to normalize the relations between these two countries. Therefore, at the end, we can say there is no clear-cut definition of why Eritreans are fleeing the country. It's too complex and too very hard to understand on individual basis. Generally, there is the abuse that we are going seeing. There is also a premeditated uh, or conspiracy against Eritrea, especially from Ethiopia, where they are uh, doing all the sorts of media, um, what we call it, information diffusion that uh, the country is too much harsh and people have come to come out. Therefore, we, we cannot say a clear cut whether this is human rights abuse or it is uh, an economic factor. Thank you, Ms. Gila.
Let me welcome Ruby Sando. Ruby, thank you so much for accepting to step in um, to the panel. As, you know, we we, are, we call Ruby at four o'clock, so I'm extremely grateful <laughs> you accepted the challenge to come and and you know join the panel for such a, an important discussion. Ruby started her career in law as a lecturer with the Civic Education Project funded by the Soros Foundation in Eastern Europe, um, but then you know returned to the UK to work as a corporate commercial lawyer with you know leading city firms. Um, she funded our collaboration to really create a platform to you know develop um, if you want some s solutions or innovative if you want avenues to bring uh, corporate social responsibility business and human rights together to address sustainability and she currently serves as a member of the law society business and human rights advisory group and is the vice chair of the solicitors international human rights group thank you so much for being with us tonight um, Ms. Kina was saying you know how sort of complex it is to describe the situation in Eritrea, but also the role that the media does play. And the media, particularly the international media, is often used, you know, um, quite important labels. You know, Mary Harper was saying that, you know, North Korea of Africa, giant slave camp, Africa most, you know, repressive state, you know, labels, they often stick. But you've been, you know, you visited the countries several times. What would you say, you know, would you say that this image portrayed um, by the media, the international media in particular, is accurate. Um, well, thank you for having me here. And forgive me if I'm a little sort of ungathered, but uh, I will ground over the sort of proceedings. Um, it's a really good question you ask. For me, um, Eritrea was very much a journey. Um, I, um, I started off looking at uh, an issue around the rehabilitation and diaspora tax, uh, which is effectively similar to a US citizen tax. Um, and I was a partner at a law firm at the time. Um, subsequently, when I left the law firm, I continued the inquiry with the uh, Solicitors International Human Rights Group. Um, and my perception of Eritrea through the media was um, extremely negative. Um, and what I was seeing on sort of simple searches and speaking to individuals or academics uh, was a was a was. Uh, only one view, a very nuanced, a very polarized view. Um, so the inquiry really started independently. Um, and I was looking at um, business ethics. How do companies operate in this so-called frontier market? And um, uh, my outreach took me to Eritrea, and um, I actually went to visit a mine. It was the um, uh, jointly owned um, uh, BMSC um, uh, mine, jointly owned by the government of Eritrea and Namco and um, a Canadian company, Nevson Resources Limited. And um, on that first trip, I was able to sort of um, really sort of get an understanding of the ground reality because um, I went through, I, I of course arrived at Asmara and then I traveled to um, the Gashbarka region, which is heading west um, of Asmara. And just meeting people um, and, and, and just talking to them um, and an, an, an interesting experience where my heritage is Indian, I understand the three dialects, which is Punjabi, Hindu and Urdu, I was able to speak to um, an Indian who was working um, at the mine, completely unplanned. I mean, um, it was, um, uh, you know, and I, I, I asked the line manager, could I actually speak to this individual? And I asked very direct and candid questions. So effectively, I didn't mean to be sort of uh, on the field and to be asking these questions, but I was sort of given permission to do this. And you get a sense from the body language when you're speaking in another dialect, whether somebody's being sort of honest or they're afraid or, and I, I didn't get that experience. As a matter of fact, it was quite sort of jovial, candid, um, you know, they, they were laughing at the situation. Um, so I, I, I came back and I wrote a report. Um, and unfortunately, um, it was very difficult to try and find um, an outlet for that report. I was the vice chair of the Solicitors International Human Rights Group, but there was such a, um, I'm thinking of a, a word which isn't so emotive, but there were individuals, including lawyers, who really said that this report should not have been published under the Solicitors International Human Rights Group because it did not reflect the situation in Eritrea. And what they meant by that, actually, if we want to be accurate, is that... Um, Business and human rights is a very uh, new, uh, innovative area that's complex. And it looks at sort of civil political rights and economic, social, cultural rights as well. And the factions here, or the polarized sort of um, view on Eritrea, is very much focused on civil 
uh, political rights, which is the elections, freedom of expression, journal, you know, the the, the journalists, etc. Um, but when you have a country as poor as Eritrea and developing, particularly with its sort of history, and you have to understand its history, the long struggle, colonization, federation, annexation, all of that, you get an understanding that they have priorities. And I find it disturbing if we go in with our Western lens and try and tell them what to do. You have to engage. And in the 21st century, engagement is not about sort of... Um, it, it's got to take a new way. We've seen what we've done in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan. We've got to take a new line. And I and, and that was my sort of leverage. So forgive me, I have gone off. So um, it was entirely different, uh, my ground reality. And I've been very open about discussing that. But I'm aware there are issues on civil political rights. We have issues here. I saw press free. Um, you only have to look at what's happening in uh, the US with the Trump election. But... I think we to, to engage with un, uh, Eritrea, we have to understand Eritrea. And I note, uh, Martin, you've got your book, Understanding Eritrea. But it requires a more holistic approach and an understanding of the complexity of the situation and that mining companies are a lifeline uh, to this country. So the question is, what with sort of the current sanctions, how do we engage with a, with a country like that? So yes, it was a very, very different sort of perception um, on the ground. And forgive me, I hope I've not sort of gone off. No, I'm sure that uh, as we open it up to the, I mean, we can really see questions coming through the chat and, you know, to the audience. This, you know, we'll discuss this more and more. But let me let me turn to um, to Georgia. I mean, you know, the polarization of the views and the different views also goes with this, you know, judgments, the shift and this, you know, positions by governments that change. Um, I mean, why do you think there have been so many recent shifts, you know, it, Particularly by the EU, by the UK, you know, vis-à-vis -vis Eritrea, and also, you know, we know that the EU is making quite a bit of money available, you know, to invest in Eritrea as in other countries, um, you know, that are sort of a source of migrants and uh, and refugees. How do you think this money can be put to good use? Can it be put to good use? Right, I'll try and answer that in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, so I guess the first question about why has there been this recent shift, um, which most people would attribute to the last kind of four or five years in Eritrea? Um, there are lots of reasons that are put forward for the kind of the initial catalyst in redefining the re-engagement, as Martin was saying, with Eritrea. I think the UN would say that they saw an opening because they managed to build some relationships which suggested that there would be room for a more conducive um, discussion around Eritrea. Um, but I think it's kind of worth looking at the two sides of this and saying, like, why did the international community want to engage more? And I think there were loads of reasons for that, um, not least from the European side, that more Eritreans were arriving um, on European soil. I think there are more concerns about regional um, security, that Eritrea is looking east to build relationships over security and trade. Um, but you've also got what's happening in Yemen and then more recently Ethiopia. So suddenly there's more of a reason to engage with Eritrea um, because of that. Uh, and the evidence that isolation hasn't really achieved any of the goals that um, the international community was looking for. So I think that's all contributed towards different thinking from that side. And then I think there, has, there have been changes in Eritrea. Um, they're, they're clearly kind of projecting an image onto the, into the international community that's different to what it was a few years ago. They're publicizing their achievements with the MDGs and in other areas. Um, they're seeing value in making statements to the international community about what it is that they're doing, um, which previously they've kind of backed away <laughs> from that, thinking we don't have to prove anything to this community that over decades has rejected us um, and shown a kind of lack of support. Um, they're encouraging industry like mining um, and then they're letting in more journalists and academics which I think is um, kind of been seen as a real shift in Eritrea is the fact that that's been taken as a proxy for the opening of the country which um, probably it is um, but I think then kind of these these uh, kind of there's a feedback loop here in that then these journalists who are going into the country are reifying this sense of a significant shift within Eritrea. Um, and I think that the coverage has been fantastic in nuancing the way in which we're looking at Eritrea and presenting 
um, kind of different narratives. What I object to that I think is, um, I'm going to say, kind of borderline irresponsible, you said you wanted a debate, um, <laughs> is that observations of what's going on in the ground are then extrapolated to grand conclusions about what is going on in Eritrea more generally. So certain things are being seen and then that is um, feeding back into a debate which is have what is what we've said about Eritrea, particularly from a human rights lens, being wrong. Yes, I've been there and I think that that is kind of a misreading of the situation in Eritrea. So I don't think that it's necessarily leading to a kind of more nuanced picture of Eritrea, which is really essential, I think. Um, often it's feeding back into this polarized debate about what's going on. Um, and I don't know whether that's the editorial pressure of having that kind of killer final paragraph, which says, what does this mean for politics in Eritrea? I don't know whether that's what feeds into it. But I, I kind of feel like there's an opportunity being missed to actually nuance the debate through this coverage. Thanks, it was really, really useful and, you know, and it's interesting in all the very many years of engagement with, with the country, the <coughs> views by, both by people that follow the country, and, you know, sort of observe, observers of the country and Eritreans remain starkly polarised. Ms. Ken, do you think that this polarization, you know, can be reconciled in any way? I mean, we, we approached you in particular because we felt actually we he is somebody that doesn't belong to one camp or the other, you know, it can present a more nuanced view. Uh, but do you think that, you know, the two sides can ever find, you know, some middle ground or how? And that's a question that I'm going to ask all of you, actually. Well, I have been in two. First, I was a devoted Eritrean which supports the government. And then I tried to oppose the government, but I have seen that the two sides are too polarized with exaggerated views. Nowadays, I don't belong to any of that. I'm the middle man, I'm going to say, in the middle. So the polarization comes is uh, the silent majority of Eritreans is not on these two sides, and nobody consults with that. <coughs> We are seeing only the vocal ones, the ones that are pro the government and they want to say, no, there is nothing in Eritrea, there is no, Eritrea is the heaven, even it's an exemplary to the world. And the other side, the opposition and the other human rights activists, they are blindly saying Eritrea is North Korea or is the hell on us. But that is not the way. Now people are getting fed up of this, the majority, because they are seeing that it's not as what the government said, it's not at what the uh, opposition says. As uh, Ruby. My, uh, Ruby has said, she has been there, but I'm sure she hasn't seen the underground what goes in Eritrea, because it's very hard for a foreigner in Eritrea to understand everything. There are dirty things that are going in Eritrea. There are uh, prisons where people are really abused, tortured and others. But this, compared to the others, if you, there are uh, narratives that they say, if you go around in Eritrea and you talk bad about the government, you get arrested. I don't believe that one. I was there, I was openly opposing some views, even in meetings. But when I was there, it didn't happen to me, that one. Therefore, it's an exaggerated. And this is, especially Ethiopians are playing a great role in dividing our population. They are using that one because they fear if the Eritrean people come together, then their stability of the TPLF rule will be in danger. Therefore, they want to, it's for their benefit, it's a political game that are, they are playing, and they are dividing. If you see medias like uh, AIGA Forum, which is a TPLF forum, and the others, you can see what they are triggering to um, divide the population. 
They say that there is Muslims are being badly treated. On the other side, they say Christians are badly treated, which is confusing. And this is reflected in some of the political actors, diaspora political actors in Eritrea, the opposition and the government. But the big dilemma is that we don't have a credible opposition in Eritrea. No, no Eritrean believes on the the majority, I mean, they, uh, doesn't trust the opposition. That's why there is a lot of conflict and dispolarization that comes in the, uh, among the people. Therefore, had we have a credible opposition, I would say that the Eritrean government <coughs> will not be at ease to abuse its people as what it is doing now. It's the lack of a credible opposition that can challenge the government that we are facing all these problems and this. The people now have lost uh, trust through centuries of international community. Nobody believes what the international community says in Eritrea, whether abroad or in Eritrea. We don't expect the international for a real solution from international community. Therefore, the people say, we wait there until this border conflict ends. Then after that, we'll see that the Eritrean people itself will challenge the, the government. What we don't know is that Eritrean people, if you go to the history of Eritrean people, uh, we, have, we had democracy for centuries and centuries. People know how to select to its own leaders. Even a village, a small village in Eritrea, every seven years used to uh, select its own leader. Even the land reshufflement in Eritrea, till now, is being done by the population every seven years. A very wealthy democratic culture is there. But the threat from Ethiopia <coughs> is much bigger than the democratic values in Eritrea, according to the people. That's why some people, they don't see this as a threat, therefore they oppose the government. And the other part says is, we have bigger problems with Ethiopia, therefore don't raise this issue now. This is the polarization that is coming. And, and then this is an important issue that comes up over and over again. You know, as you said, historically, you know, the, the border conflict has really changed. You know, the the way the government has, you know, sort of worked with its citizens, worked with its neighbors. Um, and, you know, I mean, the national service, the indefinite national service, the economic policies have resulted from that. The, the investment in the military apparatus is actually, you know, what uh, in a way constrains a lot of the policies within Eritrea. But how, you know, you said it's impossible to normalize relations between the two countries. Uh, so is, nothing can be done, you think, to reconcile this to, I mean, that is a massive driver, I think, of how, you know, the international community has been engaged in the region, of how the government has, you know, sort of positioned itself. Well, let's put it this way. Until there is uh, some change in the, uh, in one of the major factors that is currently keeping the, the, this terrible stalemate going, uh, until one of them is changed, there will not be a change. So, I mean, if uh, the uh, Eritrean regime led by President Hassas was to go, and I mean, there after all have been a number of attempts to overthrow him, uh, there have been, you know, his own tanks arrived in, in the city Asmara and came close to doing it. He's had assassination attempts on several occasions. So, I mean, it's not as if nobody has tried to do it. Uh, but, I mean, he runs an utterly ruthless campaign and people are, you know, executed uh, in large numbers when this, this occurs. And if you look at the way that he treated the, uh, the war veterans, the women, the disabled, uh, immediately after the war when there was no threat against him, and the way he suppressed the, suppressed the situation, then you understand what this man is capable of doing. Uh, he was trained under the, uh, under the Maoist regime during the Cultural Revolution, and he learned a great deal from, from what happened there, and the millions who died in that. I People be would argue that Ethiopia is not that much but, but, better. No, no, no but, absolutely. That but that, that was what I was going to. Except that we don't cover that it was quite what the I was same gonna, way. That was what I was going to come to. <laughs> so that's the one side of it. 
is, is a man who is completely <laughs> fixated on retaining his position and power and will not give it, share it in any shape, way, or form. And I certainly don't accept the kind of rather patronizing view that only the rich can afford democracy. That certainly is not my view from, from having traveled through Africa for 30 years. Um, the other point is the other side that you make, which is the Ethiopian side of it. And the Tigrayans, uh, I mean, it's a very complex relationship between the TPLF and the EPLF. And unless one gets a grip, grip on that, and it goes right back to the 1970s, and uh, the way that they, they are completely ideologically at, uh, uh, indisposed towards each other. One of them saw Eritrea as a, an undemocratic state. This was the Tigrayan view, because they didn't accept the differences of nationality and the right to secede by different nationalities. The, the Eritreans looked down on the Tigrayans because they stressed <coughs> ethnicity because they were Tigrayans within a much wider ethnicity. And it's, it's a very complex and long history. But the, it comes to a head in that appalling situation of the 84-85 famine, which I'm sure you all remember, the Bob Geldof famine, to put a you know, name on it. Perhaps I shouldn't be the one who uses the term Bob Geldof, since uh, if you look at me and Bob Geldof, we haven't had the best of relationships. Um, <laughs> But, uh, I mean, at the key moment when the people of Tigray were literally starving in their thousands uh, because of a dispute, in fact, about the border and about other issues, the, Tigrayan, the EPLF closed the border and the supply lines which were coming on from Sudan. And the TPLF were forced to build a new route out of Tigray through the most hostile terrain. Um, 100,000 Tigrayan peasants were sent to, to do this and to go to, to Sudan. And the, this is seared on the memory of the, of the Tigrayan people. And one, they don't talk about it a lot, but what, as one of them s said uh, when, when this was raised, he said, this was a savage act and history must record it as such. Nobody has forgotten what the Eritreans done, did. And because of this, this is just one element in this terrible relationship between two movements, the Tigrayans and the Eritreans, who are at loggerheads. It is not a problem between the two peoples. I mean, I have Eritrean friends who go and work in, in Ethiopia. They come, they go. It's not a problem. Ethiopians have worked for years in, in, in Eritrea. It's not a problem. Uh, I mean, there have been moments when it has been a problem. Mostly, it's fine. So it's not a, a relationship between the peoples, but the, these two movements are locked in this impossible relationship. And until something, one of them gives, and either of them could be overthrown. I mean, you only have to look at uh, the, 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 uh, the situation in, in Ethiopia, which I've, I've worked on a lot, uh, to see how, how vulnerable that regime is. Either regime could be overthrown. Both are working flat out to try and undermine each other. They both have exactly the same policy, which is to arm, manipulate. You talked about the, the propaganda. Both sides use propaganda. This is, there's nothing special about either regime. They use exactly the same tactics against each other and would love to see the other gone. But they can't. And so they're locked into this terrible sort of grip of, uh, of confrontation. And until something gives on either side, I can see no way forward, despite the best efforts, and I'm sure they're going on behind the scenes of the international community. It's heating up online, so I want to just finish this round. Ruby and Georgia, what are, what's your view? Can this polarized view be reconciled and anything done to help normalize the relation between Eritrea and Ethiopia? And I'll, I'll come to you after Ruby. Um, yes, so my inquiry um, on Eritrea was two or three years ago, and I know that Martin's been working um, uh, on this subject for a number of years. I think one way is to stop talking over each other, and it's not an or situation, it is an and situation. And Martin, just to correct you, when you say um, only the rich can afford democracy, that's not what I said. I just made a distinction that the universal, what I'm saying is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights refers to civil political rights and economic, social, cultural rights. And what we tend to do in our sort of uh, modern way of democracy or engaging is we politicize civil political rights, and that's not right. We've seen it failed in many jurisdictions that we've sort of gone in uh, with that sort of attack uh, mentality. So what I'm saying is we need more of a more of a holistic, engaged, innovative approach to this. So um, that's really important. Now, 
one of the things that I really have started looking at is the Algiers Agreement. So, Martin, I disagree with you again. Uh, this is not a, a stalemate and they're locked into it. There was a very cordial relationship between the two countries um, after Eritrea got its independence. Now, I have put out an I article... I did make that point when I introduced the subject. I was not here, so no. forgive me. Um, but... Um, um, I have. Um, I, I, I would really welcome you to um, uh, sort of uh, engage with me afterwards because I would really like feedback on some research and an article that I've written on the Algiers Agreement and the history. Um, uh, you know, coming up to uh, what happened with that agreement and the way Ethiopia behaved, and uh, how the international community uh, witnessed and guaranteed that uh, agreement. More in particularly, the cessation of hostilities agreement, which was actually guaranteed through the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not being <coughs> actioned and that's not being talked about. So we have an obligation. So this is not... I as did it, make that point. Okay, forget, I was not here, Martin. No, I know. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so that's really important. Um, so now that I'm not aware of, you know, what's been said, <laughs> um, I... I I think we need to take um, a, a more constructive uh, approach. And as I say, it's got to be and, and it's not or, it's not one or the other. I mean, given a choice of food in the bellies or election, I know I choose food in the belly first. So we've just got to be careful how we, we go in with a sort of polarized lens. It's sort of old hat. So please engage in, 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 in a manner which is uh, constructive. Now, I think the ICMM, or the uh, International Council on, on Mining and Minerals, has said the importance of companies in frontier markets with ethics, um, you know, really acting as sort of, uh, you know, providing leverage for uh, constructive engagement, forgive me, those are my words, but saying that they can really be a lifeline to bring those countries out of poverty and raise the sort of human rights uh, situation there. So that's that's the perspective that I come in. Um, I, my background is international human rights, corporate commercial, and also sustainability. I don't come from a very binary uh, position. I like to look at complexity. I know it's a very knotted situation, and I like to think of how we can approach this differently. Um, but so can I just ask you one question? Are you a consultant for one of the mining companies? Yes, the of Canadian course. I should have. Absolutely. Are you not paid by them? Yes. So I must disclose, and I do disclose at the meetings, as I did at the APPG, which you uh, spoke at. Here. Uh, um, oh, I'm so we didn't get a chance to. Yes, but um, yes, <coughs> I have been working as a consultant for Nevson Resources Limited. I have also worked independently. That was my initial inquiry when I went into uh, did, did my groundwork on reality uh, on on the sort of ground reality in Eritrea. And I've always been very open about that. And uh, my consultancy with Nevson is really looking at engagement with stakeholders on business and human rights, and what does you know corporate social responsibility mean. I'm also um, have worked with the Slim Foundation, which is um, an NGO um, and it's um, a charitable organisation that works with uh, it's composed of judges um, who go into sort of uh, different markets, uh, different jurisdictions, and uh, look at the rule of law. So I've worked under different mandates, and I'm very open about those disclosures. There's nothing to hide on that. So yes. Thanks, Ruby. Um, yeah. First, sorry, I never, I never answered the EU question. So if anyone. You can just throw it back at me. Um, then maybe just two points on Ethiopia and Eritrea that haven't been brought up. Um, one is that talking to individuals who are working for the UN and other organizations in Eritrea, they stress that like process is absolutely everything and looking at the goal head on is never an effective strategy. So thinking about how you can kind of what you're going to have to do to get round to a point where these two nations could come into a discussion, whether that's through kind of focusing on the EGAD component of this story or whether it's focusing on kind of liberal, liberalizing markets further so that you've got greater economic prosperity. So there's, um, so it's... Just clarifying what EGAD is. EGAD is the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, which... Regional. regional body in the Horn of Africa, um, which Eritrea has a... I don't even know what the right word is for their relationship. Suspended, suspended um, relationship that they think that they can unsuspend it, but they're, the members of EGAD um, think that that's a vote prior to Eritrea being able to return. Um, so yeah, thinking about how to kind of address issues um, at the sidelines prior to going directly to the border demarcation issue. Um, but then I think there's a question around who should lead this, um, Europe and North America have lost legitimacy in the, in the context of brokering this deal. Um, I, don't know, I don't know whether this um, 
is feasible, but Qatar recently successfully mediated the Eritrea-Djibouti um, kind of conflict between those two countries. And I wonder whether we need to look for kind of diplomatic help from countries that previously we hadn't necessarily drawn upon and whether kind of not looking to focus on um, the players that we currently are as the brokers in this situation might kind of be one way of approaching it from a different angle in the hope of seeing some movement. Great. Well, I think as you can see from the panel, the different views <laughs> do um, stick you know, in our discussion, but, and I've seen from some of the questions that are coming from the audience, uh, um, yeah, they're, they're focusing on um, uh, pretty much the same lines. But before I go to the online uh, questions, I want to open it up to questions from the floor, you know, from those who are here. So uh, if you want to speak, raise your hand, uh, say who you are, if you are affiliated to anyone. Uh, keep it brief so we can, you know, bring in as many questions as possible. And there are microphones around the room. You need to speak in, a, in the microphone because otherwise the online audience cannot hear. Lady in the front. Yeah. 